recording. Okay, good. Um, welcome back from spring break. Um, hopefully something happened with you over spring break that wasn't, uh, wasn't too hideous. Um, I uh, pretty much spent spring break you know, in, my, in, my, in my house. Uh, I was just, uh, I usually travel during the spring break. And, uh, you know, so instead, you know, I reread Elaine de Botton's book, The Art of Travel. I'm particularly interested in the uh, story of uh, this guy, Xavier de Maestra, um, who in 1790 wrote a book called Journey Around My Bedroom. So uh, the guy, uh, you know, wrote like a travel adventure about just walking around his house. So that was kind of, uh, <clears throat> that was kind of um, what my spring break was like, a journey around my condo. Um, so Emily, didn't, you didn't need a password to sign in the Zoom meeting. Huh, okay. I've been reading about all these, uh, you know, the, the CEO of Zoom has been apologizing because apparently Zoom is filled with security flaws and there are all these embarrassing stories about you know, people breaking into Zoom meetings and like, you know, drawing like weird stuff on the screen. So if that happens, it's not me. Okay, uh, let's get started uh, then. Um, and where to start? Um, so uh, yeah, let's talk, say a few words about the midterm. So, um, so the midterm, uh, I think this is the midterm that most of you took, the one with Sebastian and Etch-a-Sketch in it. And uh, here are the solutions. It's taking quite a long time uh, that I, my personal solutions, uh, before I talk about them, I also posted these words of advice afterwards, and, uh, and I wanted to kind of go over these uh, with you. Uh, first about uh, first about MF, MVC, uh, Model View Controller Customization Issues. Uh, so some of you uh, failed to appreciate uh, how clever MVC is, uh, the way that it handles um, your commands. So, uh, and I could tell this because some of you, you created an extension of app panel called etch panel, something like that. And then uh, you put an action perform um, method in there. Let's see, um, yeah, so here action perform. So you added an action perform method, method and your action perform method, you know, basically listen for button clicks. But that means that action perform overrode the action perform that was from the framework. So let's take a quick look at that. Um, let's see, MVC app source, MVC app. Panel. So here is my app panel. So am I not sharing the screen? Let's see, I thought I was sharing it. Okay, I think I'm sharing it now. Uh, so this is my app panel from uh, from MVC, and uh, You'll notice that I have like an action performed here, okay? And uh, I get the command, which is just a string, okay? And, and all MVC applications have the same file and help menu. So save, save as, open, uh, new, quit. Yes, I can take care of all of that for you in the framework about help, I can take care of that where different customizations or customizations differ is in the edit menu. In the uh, edit menu, you know, for example, an Etch-a-Sketch, you had like clear and move or something like that, I think. And uh, 
you know, and for BrickCAD, you had set height and set width, and they're all different, right? So how can I and the framework have any idea, you know, what the customization edit commands are? Well, that was the beauty of using the factory pattern here. So factory has make edit command, it takes this string, okay, whatever the string is, move or clear, and it makes a command object, which is then shift, shipped off to the command processor for execution. Okay, so I'm already listening, even though I don't know what your buttons are, I don't know what your edit menu items are, I'm listening for them and I'm handling them. If you override this guy, Okay, well, then I'm not going to be able to take care of the edit menu anymore. So usually the symptom here was the edit menu failed in some way. Um, there was another issue here too, which is, I just said how great the MVC framework is. It also is flawed. Uh, so I gave you this code where I override the add component method that comes from JPanel, okay? And, and I call super.add, so I'm calling that method, but I add this extra line here. It says, if the component you're adding, you know, usually what are you adding? You're adding buttons or subpanels or text fields, but if the component you're adding happens to be a view, then I'm gonna add it to my list of views. Remember up here, I've got, it's a set of views. I've got a set of views here. And the reason that I need that set of views is here, set model. So set model gets called when you open a uh, file open or file new, when you create a new model or opening an old model. And what I've gotta do is, I've got to tell all of the views, hey, there's a new model in town. Okay, and so, uh, and so if you don't do this, then what you see happens is that, uh, you know, when you say file new or file open, uh, suddenly the application stops working. The views don't update themselves anymore. Okay, so that's because, um, that's because you weren't calling this, this add method when you added your view, or you added your view, but the view is nested inside of a panel, and so that wasn't, uh, that wasn't seen. Um, let's see, questions here. You submit the design from SimStation, can we get credit? No, sorry about that. Um, let's see, what else did I want to, other points? So that was the point about adding this. So that's actually kind of a flaw in the framework that you know, I have to like, I have to do this. Uh, also, don't forget to call changed. Uh, don't fire your own property events, call changed because the changed method sets that unsaved changes flag. So that was another common mistake. And then UML, so, uh, so two things I'd like you to get out of this class, if you're only gonna get two things out of the class, is how to read and do UML diagrams, and of course, how to use design patterns. So here is, let me make the screen a little bit smaller. Here's kind of a generic diagram. Um, so, so there are, there are these two types of arrows here that people are getting mixed up by it. There's this arrow, which is called the generalization arrow. Okay? And, and in Java, that translates to extends. Okay? And then there's this arrow, has the same triangular arrowhead, but the shaft of the arrow is dashed. Okay? That's called the realization arrow in UML, and it translates into implements in Java. This arrow only connects a class to an interface. That's the only time I want to see this arrow. Okay. Uh, otherwise, interface extends interfaces, classes extend classes. Okay. Here is the code that this guy generates. So interface one is just an interface. Interface two extends interface one. 
class two extends interface one and implements interface two. Okay, so um, that and that's good. And they, both of these kinds of arrows imply inheritance. Okay, and they um, also imply subtypes. So class two is a subtype of interface two and class one. Uh, class two inherits from class one. Uh, interface two inherits abstract methods from interface one and then maybe adds some additional. And then class two inherits the abstract methods from interface two, which means that now he has to implement those. Um, next. Um, you know, so I told you, think about class diagrams as, um, you, you know, as, or get translated or compiled into Java. Right? So you have to be careful with your class diagrams because treat them like code. They, you can also translate a class diagram into English. Okay? And the translation there is that classes and interfaces translate into types of objects. Generalization and realization arrows translate into is a, and association arrows translate into has a, owns a, uses a, there are several other possible translations. And so here, for example, I have a class diagram, and here is the, the translation of this diagram into English. Car, that's a type of object, uh, is a vehicle and has an engine. Okay, that's the association arrow, and that's the generalization arrow. Here's another class diagram. This is a bad one. Let's translate this. So this says a car is a driver, a car has a engines, this, this guy like shows a plural name for his class, and a car has a vehicle. Okay, so when you translate your diagram into English, if it doesn't make sense, if it sounds funny, this one sounds very funny and is illogical, then there's something wrong with your class diagram. So that's like a quick test to see if like your diagram makes sense. And then here is one other UML comment. So here I've got a prisoner class and a strategy class. A one-way association, a prisoner has a strategy. And he also has an attribute strategy. Here's the code that gets generated from prisoner. Notice it has two fields called strategy. Okay, so that's because endpoints and attributes both translates to fields. Um, so choose one or the other. Don't have uh, both an attribute and an endpoint. So question here. Explain the fix to the last diagram. That's probably a good idea. Um, right. So so basically to fix this diagram, I'm sure that, I was worried that I got the wrong screen on. To fix this diagram. Uh, you need to swap these two arrows. So a car is a vehicle, a car extends vehicle, and a car has a driver. And you always want to like label like a, a navigable end, navigable endpoint of an association. Association solid shaft with a barbed arrowhead. So if there is an arrowhead there, then you must write the multiplicity in the name. So a car has one driver, and you know, maybe the name of the driver is driver. So we're just switching these two arrows. Oh, and then changing the name of uh, engines to singular. Class names should always uh, be singular. I mean, there are a few rare exceptions for that. Um, there's one other, I'll go back to our diagram in a minute. Uh, one other problem, um, which wasn't your fault, uh, but um, Eclipse, some of you reused a lot of your turtle code, which to some extent was okay. And um, 
Eclipse has this nasty habit of saying, oh, he's including some turtle code. I'm going to stick an import turtle statement into his program. And Eclipse also has this nasty habit of collapsing all of your import statements so you don't see that import statement. And now suddenly your code won't compile. Uh, especially it doesn't compile. It may be compiled for you because you had turtle Probably the turtle code was right there in your project, but I didn't have your turtle code in my project, so it wouldn't compile there because it couldn't find anything about turtles. Uh, and so I had to go comment out that import statement in order to get the codes to, to compile. So um, that's something just to be aware of that Eclipse does that. Let's go back and just say like a word about this solution. So this was that Sebastian problem. All right, so let's read through this. So a score has, so I said it has a, could also be has many or has some. A score has zero or more notes in it, has, has many notes in it. A note is still singular though. A notes here is where the plural comes in. Score has zero or more notes. Okay. Uh, score has an instrument. Okay. Interface instrument here is just uh, it's just an interface. And then piano, trumpet, and flutes. Uh, a piano is an instrument. A trumpet is an instrument. A flute is an instrument. Okay, so they. Uh, and since the instruments and interface and piano, trumpet, and flute are classes, then um, we need the realization arrow here. Okay. And this is like the strategy design pattern, right? Because you can think of the uh, the instrument as the strategy for playing each note in the score. Um, and then, uh, and unfortunately, organ here predates all of this stuff, so organ cannot cannot implement interface, okay, because that code is fixed. And so I created organ adapter, which uses the organ, organ as an adaptee. So an organ adapter is an instrument. That's the adapter pattern. And the code for play, you know, is just going to go to the instrument and ask it to play, play each note in the score. Right. Um, presumably the way that a piano plays a note is different from the way, say, a trumpet plays a note. If I wanted to add a um, new instrument here, like a tuba, I'd create a tuba class that implements the instrument interface. Right. Uh, this is better than just having an enumeration for the type of instrument, because that means play is going to be what sometimes called a a dispatch. It'll say, well, if it's this kind, if it's a piano, play it this way, else if it's a trumpet, play it this way, else if, else if, else if. Right? And that'll have to be updated each time a new kind of instrument is introduced. Okay. So um, moving on here, I'm going to click on the demos link. I want you to do this too. Hopefully you have Eclipse running. So uh, here I've got um, these two classes, thread demo and console. So thread demo, this works, uh, comes to this code here. Okay, and this is a bunch of classes, but it's a class called manager. Okay, and um, what I want you to do is to, um, is to create package called thread demo all lowercase letters and uh, that package could be either in a new project or some existing project and then i want you to paste uh, these um, create like a manager class and a console class and load this code into it so while you're doing that uh, i'm going to you're doing that. I'm going to make a few fixes to my code, and um, and then we'll talk about that in a minute.
Okay, so um, somebody um, somebody is unmuted here. So the uh, check to make sure you're unmuted and that you're muted rather. Let's see if I can find the. I'm the violator here. Um, Lynn, are you muted? No, you're muted. Lynn's muted. Yeah, it looks like everybody's cool now. Okay, so I'm going to go to lectures and multi threading in Java. I'm going to scroll to the bottom of the screen here and say a few words about the master slave design pattern. So, master slave design pattern is a very common design pattern that's used in multi threaded applications. Okay, so uh, there's a master class and a slave class, and these double bars on the slave class indicates that slaves are active objects. Uh, active object has its own little virtual machine that it runs its code in. That virtual machine is called a thread. So, uh, so a master has zero or more slaves, okay? And all of those slaves, again, are running uh, running inside different threads of control, their own threads of control. Okay, every slave, this is a bidirectional association, so every slave has a reference back to the master. Uh, sometimes the master can provide services to the slaves. Examples of services would be communication services if one slave wants to send a message to another slave. Uh, Let's see, broadcasting service, the slave wants to broadcast a message to all the other slaves, uh, discovery services, um, so a slave needs some information about other slaves. So we saw that, for example, in, uh, in SimStation, we have this get neighbor, so the slave needs, uh, needs a neighbor. Um, and also the master might provide some sort of a shared execution environment resources and so forth that all of the slaves use master has start stop suspend resume which just goes down uh, this list of slaves and calls starts all of the slaves stops them suspends them resumes them so that's a very common pattern while these slaves are running the master can go do something else or the master can just wait for all of the slaves to finish their job. Master and slave don't have to be the names of the classes. In a design pattern, remember, you're supposed to think of these as roles rather than classes. And so there are a lot of variations on, on this pattern. Um, there is a lab, which, okay, let's go to the code that you just downloaded. See, um, mine I think was called. So I think I called mine th package thread six. But uh, so here's this console class. This console class is just a real basic uh, console user interface and that I use again and again. It's got a control loop in it. This control loop has perpetual while true, so basically forever. It prints a prompt. It reads a command from the user. There are certain meta commands that it knows how to deal with, like quit, help, about. So, you know, very similar to what MVC does, but MVC, of course, is a graphical user interface on it. And then it comes down here. If it wasn't any of those, so for example, if it was quit, then we break out of the loop. Uh, for all of these others like help, we do a continue, we go back up. Otherwise, we execute the command. My execute method 
Okay, uh, it just echoes, just return, just echoes whatever command you, you typed in. So, so uh, here I'm printing out, like if you type in, uh, if you type in hello, I type return echo hello. So, um, so, but the idea is that you subclasses and override this execute. So that's kind of a useful little, nice to have like a, a, a console user interface that, you know, very generic, you can just like, you know, whip out whenever you need like a simple user interface. Let's look at the manager code. So manager extends console. Okay, so, um, so this guy, uh, well, let's take a look. He has an array of agents. Here, uh, and what is an agent? An agent is gonna be, um, well, the manager is gonna be the master and the agents are gonna be the slaves in this, this instantiation of master-slave pattern. So he creates these two uh, slaves, these two agents, more on those later. And then he overrides, here's my override of execute, right? Uh, suspend, he suspends all of the agents. Uh, resume, he resumes all of the agents. Start, he starts all the agents. Stop, he stops the agents. And then status here is he prints out each agent. Come up and look at the agent class. So there are two ways, I'll show you both ways to create an active object in Scala. One way is to implement the runnable interface. Runnable interface is a method in it called run. Okay, so here are the agent properties. He has a name, he has a state, and here are my agent states running, suspended, stopped, and ready. And then here's his little virtual machine that he owns. He has this little virtual machine that he's gonna to use to run this code in. Okay. Um, here we have uh, stop, sets a state to stopped. Suspend sets a state to, and is stopped, return state equals stopped. Right. Suspend, uh, resume, uh, basically calls notify. Notify is a method inherited from the object base class. And we're going to learn all about notify today. Um, and here's run. So because I'm runnable, I have to, uh, I have to implement run. Okay. And so run, the most important feature is while you're not in a stop state, okay, you call update and then you sleep for 100 milliseconds, microseconds, milliseconds, I think milliseconds. Okay, that's be called being cooperative. And if you end up suspended, you wait. Wait is another method inherited from the object based class. But, but update, sleep, update, sleep, you're just doing that over and over again. What is update? Uh, it's abstract. Here's pi approximator, he extends agent. And so he needs an update method. In his update method, he is replacing his local variable pi up here, which is initially zero, by plus or minus four divided by n. And n is gonna be one, three, five, seven, it goes up by two each time. So this is, I think, uh, this thing up here, I think is the Taylor of Taylor expansion of, uh, of arc tangent. I don't know if you still study that in calculus. Um, here's another kind of an agent. This is a prime generator agent. Okay, and uh, he uh, he generates prime numbers. And last prime is the last prime number he generated. And so he increments it. And up every time update is called, he increments it by one. It will be the new last prime. He increments it by one, and then he tests to see if uh, that's a prime number, if last prime is a prime. If, if not, then next time he gets called, he'll increment it again, right? And if it is, uh, so he keeps doing this. So I can see we've got a while loop inside of update.
update. So he keeps doing this, going around this loop, incrementing last prime by one until last prime is another prime number. And then we come out of the loop, and we print out that prime number. Okay, so manager then is, uh, is you know, going to start, stop, suspend these agents. So let's try to run that now. So uh, we'll click on manager. I think he's the guy with the main method, yeah, job application. I just, there's that prompt. Status. So uh, my agents, I gave them silly names. Optimus Prime is in the ready state, and Pi Eater is the name of the other one. Is in the ready state. So let's start them up. Okay. And we see the screen filling up. I suspend. Okay, and you can see that. Uh, that Optimus Prime is busy generating prime numbers and Pi Eater is getting better and better approximations of Pi. You see these green letters in here? That is me typing in suspend. And the reason that happens is because all of these, these threads, the, you know, the agents, Pi Eater and Optimus Prime, and uh, the manager are all sharing uh, the console window. I think when they do system.out.println, it's all going to the same place. Now here I can resume. Still generating primes and approximating primes. I type in stop. I type in status. And we see they're both in the stop state. If I type in Resume, nothing happens because it's over. They're dead, they're stopped. I'd have to type start. We would be starting all over again. So then I can type quit. It's done. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you uh, are able to get this running. If not, then you need to talk to me, maybe during office hours or whatever, let me know. Um, and that is, you know, a basic example of master-slave pattern. The manager is playing the role of master, and higher pro agent is playing the role of master. agent is playing the role of slave. <clears throat> okay, you have a similar sort of thing in your homework simulation is playing the role of master. And there too, agent, you have an agent class, which is similar to this agent class, uh, which is playing uh, the role of slave. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to back up here and go on to, we just talked about multi-threading in Java. Let's talk about synchronization in Java. Okay, so, uh, so in this example, um, let's see, I think I've got the code for it loaded in. You can load this code in too, um, if you want. Um, I have, uh, I have, up here, I'm sharing this with you. Yes, I have up here uh, a package called banking, and inside it's got bank.java. Okay, and let's take a look at bank.java. So, so here, bank is the master. And the slaves are, we have two kinds of slaves, a producer and consumer. Okay, and so this is, this is a little bit older code, but it shows like another way of, another variation of master slave for you. So here I've just got a main method. So all the action happens in main. Main creates a bank account object, and then here he's, um, let's see, whoops, this is, I'm locked 
this. So ignore, uh, let's get rid of this code for right now. Oops, well, I'll just leave it there. Ignore the commented out code. So slaves is an array of four slaves. Okay, and now uh, two of those slaves are producers and two of those slaves are consumers. And what producers do is they deposit money into the account. What consumers do is they withdraw money from the account. Okay, and now uh, what the master does is he starts all of the slaves up. And then here's like another thing a master can do. So uh, in the last example, the manager was the master. And while the slaves were running in their own threads, the, he's, the master is listening for your keyboard input commands coming from the keyboard. Here's another variation. So what the master does here is he goes through the array of slaves and for each one he calls the slaves join method. Now join, it's a thread method, okay? And what it does is it causes the master to be suspended until this slave terminates. When he terminates, the master is unsuspended and he goes up and grabs the next slave and joins him. If that slave is already done, is already stopped, right? Then this does nothing. You know, he just goes on. Doesn't you know, nothing happens. He just goes on. And this, so this kind of code here, it's a very typical kind of code, is how the master waits for all of the slaves to die. And then when all of the slaves are dead, you know, the master can you know pick up all of the pieces or like do some final analysis, something like that. Here, I'm going to print out the closing balance of the account. Let's go up here and take a look at this bank account. Here's my, um, well, let's, let's, let's look at the producer and consumer. So, so producer here, so this is a different way, let's see if we should five in your example. So this is a, a different way of creating a thread. Instead of implementing runnable, Okay, instead of uh, where, where you have a thread, a uh, producer extends thread. So the producer is a thread. So you can extend thread or implement runnable. Extending thread is conceptually a little bit easier, uh, but you know, most software engineers prefer uh, implementing runnable. So uh, the producer has a bank account Okay, and then his run method, so thread has a run method, uh, but which is, you know, call the run method of some, you know, some runnable object. Uh, or you can override, so here when we're extending thread, you override that run method. And my override is uh, for I equals zero to five, deposit $10. So I'm gonna deposit, uh, Ten dollars five times, right? so that's a um, total of fifty bucks that I'm going to deposit. Uh, here's the consumer, also has an account, and the consumer is going to withdraw ten dollars five times, withdraws fifty dollars. And remember, I have two producers and two consumers, so the producers collectively will be putting in like. Um, $100 and the consumers collectively will be removing $100. And I think, oh, here, the account, the account, let's give it an initial balance of 100 bucks. Uh, this is all changed because in the last section, you know, I've you know, played around with this code a lot. Okay. <clears throat> So, um, so, you know, and you can imagine, you know, something like this might be like your baby version of like ATM code where you have like a joint bank account, right? And, you know, the husband's, you know, trying to withdraw $50 up in San Francisco and, you know, the wife is, you know, depositing $50 in San Jose and, you know, the order of operation is important. So. That would be an example of a multi-threaded application. Here's my bank account class. A bank account has a balance in the account. 
Uh, here's get balance and here is, here's deposit. Let's look at deposit. I'm gonna deposit some amount of money in here. Now, my algorithm here is really uh, aggravating algorithm. I take the current balance and I transfer it into a local variable temp. Increment temp by the amount, and then for some unknown reason here, I fall asleep for 300 milliseconds. Why? Well, because I can. It was, I was hard making all of that money, good doing that deposit, so I need to take a nap. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna print out the value of temp, and only here at the very end of this thing am I gonna actually copy temp back into balance. So it took me a long time to get around to doing this. Withdraw is similarly laconic, right? He sleeps for 200 milliseconds, he, you know, and then only at the end does he copy temp back into balance. Okay, so let's run that now. Okay, so uh, here we see all of the activity of the slaves, okay, and then the slaves all die off in the end here. And now the master, which is the bank, uh, comes back and prints the closing balance. And right away, um, you should see a problem here. Right? The initial balance is 100 bucks. Uh, the, the consumers, remember, collectively took out 100 bucks, and the producers collectively put in 100 bucks. Right? And so, so you'd expect the closing balance to be 100 bucks. Right? But instead, it's 150 bucks. And if you study this output carefully, you see all of these problems happening. Like here, uh, some consumer was, uh, was withdrawing $10. So the new balance was about to be $90. But before he updated it, he got interrupted by a producer who saw that the balance was still $100. Okay? And so now, he's going to, he's about to write in that the new balance will be $110. Which one of these guys happened first? Okay. And, and this example underlies what is the big major problem. My computer over to the door. Yeah, I scratch my door. This, this uh, shows what the big problem is with multi-threading. When threads share a variable, come on, Nikki. When threads share a variable, uh, the order of access to the variable uh, can mean the difference between the program being correct or not. It can mean the difference between a bank losing money or not in this case. Okay, so, uh, so what this is called a synchronization problem. And there are several uh, different types of synchronization problems. This one's called a race condition because they're racing to access this, uh, this variable. Now, some of you might be thinking here, well, the reason that this happened, the real reason that this happened is because of the way that I implemented deposit withdraw, right? Uh, you know, I'm taking naps and all of that nonsense here. Here is like a new implementation of deposit withdraw. Instead of like taking my sweet time, blam, balance plus equals amount. Blam, balance minus, balance minus equals amount. One single command done over with. So if you replace deposit withdrawal with these methods, it does fix the problem temporarily. Like if you leave it running for a long time, as like an ATM machine is running forever, eventually discrepancies appear. Why is that? Well, the Java instruction, balance plus equals amount, actually compiles into four assembly language instructions. Okay, now, some of you may have taken CS47. I don't know if this is CS47 or 147. We learn about the fetch execute cycle. This is the algorithm implemented in hardware by the CPU. Fetch an instruction, execute, fetch, execute, fetch, execute. Just keep going until you reach the end of the program. 
But uh, a subtle feature there is uh, after it executes an instruction, the CPU checks for pending interrupts, interrupts from other threads. And um, in some cases, will service those interrupts before fetching the next instruction. So it's only here, this last assembly language instruction, that balance is being updated. So here I'm copying balance into register one, right? I'm adding, you know, doing some stuff. I'm copying register two back into balance. So we could have been interrupted. This producer could have been interrupted by a consumer. So it's, it's you know, bad luck. Uh, eventually, after running a long time, it is going to happen that an interrupt will get right there. So you've still got like a problem. Solution, so I think we talked about this last time, is, uh, well, I travel a lot. So um, I always think about, uh, think about synchronization in terms of synchronizing access to the bathroom on an airplane. And on the way that it's managed there is that the door has a lock on it. If you go into the bathroom, you know, you lock the door. And now if you go to the bathroom and the door is locked, you queue up, you get in line, uh, waiting for the bathroom door, bathroom to become available. Okay, so locks are things that have to be, um, have to be provided by the operating system because you can't test a lock and then set the lock in two steps. It has to be done in one single indivisible step. It can't be interrupted like we were talking about before. So the way that that manifests in Java, and Java, uh, remember we have this object base class here. All, everybody inherits from this object base class. Okay? Uh, and the policy in Java is that every object can be used as a lock. And to support that, we have holder here, which is a thread. This is the thread that currently holds the lock that's currently inside the bathroom. And then sync queue here. These are the threads that are, that's the queue outside the bathroom, the threads waiting uh, to be, uh, you know, waiting to be, uh, waiting for access. Here's the way that we lock the lock. Okay, so let's say OBJ is any object at all. And so synchronized OBJ, so what that does is a test and set. It tests to see if the lock is, is open, if there's like a holder, so if holder is equal to null, okay? And, and then it, if it is, it, it sets the lock, okay? It becomes the holder of the lock. And then it goes into this block of code here. So you can think of this block of code as the bathroom itself. It goes into the bathroom. This block of code is sometimes called the critical section. So we only want one thread at a time in the critical section. Here is the other scenario. Let's say there is somebody in the bathroom already. So then what happens is when a thread calls synchronize on the lock for that bathroom, Okay. Uh, since it is locked, uh, the thread is, is suspended, immediately suspended. And it goes in, um, is the word, you know, suspended state. And it goes into the synchronization queue up here. Okay. When, uh, when the thread that's in the bathroom comes out of the bathroom, exits, okay, the first guy in the synchronization queue resumes and he goes into the bathroom. Now think about it from that guy's point of view, from that agent's point of view, right? Uh, he tested the lock and then he went into the bathroom, right? He doesn't realize that, he didn't realize that he's actually was suspended. It might have been, he might have been waiting for that bathroom for 20 minutes, but, uh, but he doesn't know it because he was out cold. He was unconscious. So this might be like a nice feature for, for um, airplanes, right? When you test the lock, if it's locked, then you get some kind of like, you know, some kind of like electric shock that knocks you out until the bathroom's available again. I think I'm, do you think I'm stretching this metaphor far enough here? <clears throat> so, uh, here is the new code okay, for my producer.
Let's see. So I'm here for the producer. Um, this is the consumer. Where's my producer? So he's going to use the account itself as the lock. Okay, it doesn't matter what lock we use, what object we use, as long as everybody agrees. Okay, and so he's only going to do his deposit if he's the only one who has access to the account. Okay, and similarly down here for my consumer, consumer will withdraw $10. Now let's run it again. Much more orderly looking behavior. And look at the closing balance is $100, same as the opening balance. And that's because there weren't two guys inside of the deposit withdrawal procedure at the same time. Okay. So. Let's see, okay, what am I sharing? I'm sharing this guy now. Okay, fine. Oh, did I maybe did I actually was I sharing the screen when I did that? So I don't know if I was sharing the screen again. I'll just show it again to you really quickly in case I wasn't. Here I am. I'm updated the code. And my closing balance is a hundred bucks. And if you look at it, like everybody was really polite and took turns. Okay, so uh, here is another variation of this. So in this variation, the account has got zero, zero dollars in it. Uh, we'll have three consumers and one producer. The producer deposits $10 15 times. It's a total of 150 bucks. And each of the three consumers withdraws $10 five times. Let me set that up for you. Oh, sorry. Is this in my end? Okay, here we are. So now in this version, right, the uh, consumer is going to, the, the producer is going to put in $15, was it 10 times? Let's check. Deposits $10 15 times. Fifteen times, he's going to put in ten dollars. And here, the consumer, I think, withdraws five dollars ten times. Ten dollars five times, right? And then here is the configuration. So I've got, in this configuration, I've got three consumers and one producer, okay? So, um, and let's um, just launch that, see how it goes. Something weird happens here. Um, I think I'm just getting the old code. A second, so here he's depositing ten dollars fifteen times. Hmm. 
Something is not quite doing what I thought it was supposed to do. Okay, I'll withdraw $10. Oh, 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 yeah, I remember and I forgot. The initial balance is supposed to be zero dollars. Okay, now let's run it. Okay, so here it ran correctly. You know, there wasn't like a bug in here, but there was something that you know, would make an economist cry, which was uh, up here, all of these insufficient funds, right? I mean, there were sufficient funds, right? because if you think about it, the producer produced $150 and the consumers withdrew, uh, wanted to withdraw 150 bucks. But, uh, but sometimes there wasn't enough money in there. And so in the end, uh, we still have $50 left over, right? So, and the problem of course here was that these consumers were trying to withdraw the money before the money was there. Okay, so what we need to do is figure out a way to prevent that from happening. And so here is the next little thing to know. So also uh, the object class has a second queue in it called a notification queue. These are threads waiting to be notified. Okay, and the object class has a notify method in it too. So for example, if OBJ is like some lock, okay, notify basically takes someone off the notify queue, wakes that per wakes them up. So all of the threads in the notify queue, like the sync queue, they're all suspended. So it resumes somebody from the notify queue. And there's like, you know, a couple of variations of this. Also there's, so wait uh, is how you join the notify queue. So when you wait on a lock, you go into the notify queue. Here's how I'm going to use that. So uh, here uh, for consumer, um, I'm going to synchronize in the account. So I'll I'll wait for the account to be uh, to be uh, available, right? I mean, this whole bit here that's the critical section. It's inside the bathroom. So I'll wait. And when I get in, uh, this is the consumer, uh, I'll say while the account balance is less than $10, if there's no money in there, then uh, I'm going to wait. Okay, so if there isn't, now the consumer sees, oh, there isn't $10, or I want $10, but there isn't $10, okay, then uh, he asks to join the, he has to join the, uh, uh, the wait queue, the queue of, called up here, it's called um, Notify Queue. He's asking, he goes into the Notify Queue. When you go into the Notify Queue, it unlocks the bathroom door. Okay, so somebody else can get in there. Here's the producer code, pretty much the same as before. So after we deposit the 10 bucks, we call Notify. Okay, so if anybody is waiting, uh, then, uh, then that, that person gets notified. So I'm going to copy this code here. And let's go back to consumer code. Okay, and what I'm going to do here is, oh, here's the synchronization. Format that a little bit. So before you withdraw the ten dollars, I'll put in this while code. And up here. Um, after the ten dollars is deposited, I'll notify. 
anybody is suspended. So now let's run that again. And notice that nobody went away empty handed. There's no insufficient funds. And in the end, there's zero dollars left in the accounts. Okay. So uh, wait, notify, and synchronize uh, you know, are the main primitives that we have for for solving synchronization issues in Java. Now, one last little twist on this, which is I don't, I don't, the, the big problem, let's go back up and look at this code again for a second. The big problem here is that responsibility for synchronized access is on the slaves, is on the threads themselves. Right, so producer and consumer both have to do this synchronize. Okay, so, so that means that that means if um, that means that, that it, let's say that there's going to be a lot of different types of threads of slaves in a particular application, and these slaves are all being implemented by different programmers. Every one of these programmers has to have the correct synchronization code. If one of these programmers didn't take my 151 class and he didn't know about synchronization, how you do synchronization, doesn't have the right, maybe he's synchronizing on the wrong object, for example, the wrong lock, then you've introduced a very subtle bug into the system. The whole system is, is, is not going to is not going to work. So it's too much to expect the slaves to synchronize. So a better solution is to have the object itself, the shared object, synchronize access. And then, uh, an object that synchronizes access to its methods is called, sometimes referred to as a monitor. So here's the generic, here's the pattern here. So I have a monitor class, some state, and something that updates its state. Okay, and, and so what I'll do is inside here, I will synchronize access. Here's the code that updates the state. I synchronize access on myself. So now the producer and consumer, are the, you know, the slaves, they don't have to synchronize because the shared resource, the monitor here is self-synchronizing. Same thing, and, here's, and here is shorthand for this. So if you write synchronize, in front of any method, then it's shorthand for what we've done up here, right? Uh, here, a synchronized method, only one method at a time can access it. The body of that method is critical, a critical section. Okay, so now, here's my new bank account class. So here, uh, deposit, for example, I just write the word synchronized here. And then it can also do the notification too. So this is a deposit. Uh, so I'll notify, I call notify here. And here's withdraw, I call synchronized. And here I can do my little wait state if there aren't, if there aren't enough funds. Okay, and, and now consumer and, and producer go back to like their old simple code, right? Uh, I'm just gonna try to withdraw $10 from account. I don't have to synchronize because here's another way of putting it because account is thread safe. Monitor is something that's thread safe. So you can call it from multiple threads and it synchronizes, self synchronizes access. That way, the people who write these slave classes don't have to be geniuses. They don't have to coordinate with each other. Now, let's see, getting toward the end here, let me. Um, let me show you how uh, that should be used, why that should be useful to you. So I'm gonna take a look at my, 
NVC apps uh, in, let's see, uh, SimStation. Let's look at my agent code. So this is my agent class. Okay, it's abstract. It implements serializable. Now, why is that? Well, because simulation is the model. Simulation extends model. So, uh, so it's serializable and everything in it, including all of the agents, they have to be serializable too. Remember, we need to do the model and everything associated with it. It has to be so we can save it to a file and read it back in again. And I also implement runnable. You can implement as many interfaces as you want. Okay, and so here, you know, I've got like a thread state, I've got a name. This is a pointer, the simulation is the master and the agent is the slave. So here's my reference, I call it world, which is sort of a stupid name. Uh, here is the agent state, for example, I've got a heading and a position. And here's my run method. So this is very similar to the one that we saw before. You know, I, I uh, you know, update sleep, update sleep, and so forth. Now here is, uh, let's take a look at a good one here. Um, uh, resume. So it would be bad if several threads tried to call resume at the same time, right? Only one at a time calls resume. So I wrote the word synchronized here. And all of these methods are synchronized. Let's look at another example. I guess a better example would be here in simulation. So simulation extends model. This is the master. Okay, and remember this get neighbor. So this is a service that the master provides to the slaves, uh, that the simulation provides to the agents. Agent can ask for a neighbor, but uh, I don't want two agents to be calling this method at the same time. So I write the word synchronized in front of it. So access is synchronized. And so you need to do this in, uh, you need to do this in your sim station. You need to think about this when you create, um, when you create some sort of a shared resource for a bunch of agents. Um, its methods need to be, uh, some of its methods need to be synchronized. Um, all right, good. Um, so I think that's all I have to say about that. Are there questions about synchronization? All right, uh, Thursday. Thursday, there is gonna be a graded in-class lab. So don't not show up Thursday. Um, so, um, so, you know, bring your computers, be ready. It's like gonna be some kind of uh, something involving in the synchronization and multi-threading. And um, so we'll work on that in class. We'll do a lot of it together in class. Everybody should be, will be successful for it, but, but, but it would be unsuccessful if you didn't do it at all. Right, anything else? Quiet, okay, that's fine. All right, well, I'm gonna have an office hour in about 15 minutes. So if you have questions, we can carry on there. And I will um, talk to all of you on Thursday.